right, I think I hacked in. We're on the air? Shh, security's outside. But how's my hair? It's a radio station. Psst, psst. You guys hear about the Beyond the Shadows podcast with Ryan and Scott? You guys into paranormal? What about true crime? How about UFOs and cryptids? We also have mad hauntings. We got security. No, we don't. We're not big enough to need it yet. No, we got security. Hey, what are you guys doing? Get out of here. Listen to the Beyond the Shadows podcast. Beyond the Shadows. What's up, thingies? Yeah, that's right. I called you a thingy. Do you like it? No? Yeah? Not really? Okay. Well, that's okay. Um, it's a work in progress. I'm just trying to come up with a nickname for you guys because I find it, I don't know, it's just not fun to call you one nothingers. It's its a mouthful. I'm just trying to shorten it, you know. Lots of lots of cool podcasts have like a nickname for their audience. So if you guys have any recommendations, hit me up with them. Um, but with me tonight, I have one really good thingy, one really awesome thing. <laughs> I don't know if you're enjoying that as much as I am, but with me tonight, David. Say hi. Hey, David. hey guys, how's it going? So you remember, uh, may remember David from episode nine and from Down the Rabbit Hole and Deeper Down Apparel. Um, so yeah, give us your little spiel again about yourself and what you do, and just for our new listeners who are joining us for this episode, tell us about yourself. Well, how about you know one other thing? How about winners? Is that good? Winners. Ooh. I like that. What's up, winners? It sounds a lot better than what's up, losers. <laughs> I do yeah, like well, that. David, I uh, run Down the Rabbit Hole on Instagram and Facebook. I also have an Etsy shop called Deeper Down. It has all sorts of things. It's got... oh. Sorry, that was me on accident. Ignored that. Whoa. I just accidentally called David in the middle of him trying to tell us about himself. So sorry. <laughs> That's all right. And uh, yeah, that's that's basically me. I share videos that are uh, paranormal in nature that are that feature cryptids or uh, conspiracies or anything like that. Any rabbit hole will go down together and you can find it on Instagram and Facebook. Excellent. Thank you. And as someone who is currently awaiting one of your amazing pieces of apparel, I can't wait to rep it let me tell you i'm gonna go everywhere. yes you're getting a shirt it's coming pretty soon i know i'm super excited about it really pumped i can't wait i'll post it on my story when i get it so everyone who's curious to see what it looks like i'll show you it looks badass i'm super excited and i'm ready for people to be like oh what is that logo what does that mean so i can tell them all about you yay yeah but i wanted to say that since the last time since episode nine you know, I had pretty good following. I think we we're like just under 15,000. And ever since we did episode nine on one nothing, I'm well over 22,000 now. Thank you. Thank no, you. Thank you for joining us for that. But obviously you were well received, but that's huge and crazy and kind of jealous, but really awesome. I'm so proud of you that you were able to achieve that. That is not easy, especially the number that you've surmassed on Instagram. It's so hard to get a following on Instagram. So that's impressive. Thank you. Thank you. I, I definitely part, you're part of it. Uh, I think that episode was great. We had a fun time. Uh, we had a really good time. It was fun. It was very fun. Even though the subject matter was very gruesome and sad. Yeah, right that's true. But that's what long nothing's about, right? That is. That's what it's all about. You try to blank out that like 20 minutes of horribleness. And then the rest of the episode, we just joke around and have fun. So it makes up for it, right? Hopefully. That's right. You know? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so last time we did our red flag, green flag with you. So we're going to do something different this time. I wanted to put you on the spot and ask you to tell me any embarrassing story that you're comfortable sharing with our listeners. Oh, man. <laughs> man, okay. Let's see. Uh, embarrassing story embarrassing story i'm perfect i'm sorry i don't have anything i know it's what makes it so frustrating <laughs> i don't i don't get embarrassed you know it's just i do stupid things all the time so i'm just used to being ridiculous in public uh, so you just don't get embarrassed that's convenient i'm honestly i'm pretty jealous there's gotta be something i'm sure there is but nothing is coming to mind right now i want to say like i forgot to put on 
pants and went to work or something like that, but that's like dreams or something. I don't, I can't remember anything <laughs> that really embarrassed me. There's got to be something. Oh, oh, okay, okay. I have to go back to, oh, I have to go back to my youth. So I was. Stop. I was in high school. I was in high school and uh, I was, you know, talking to this blonde girl. She was very pretty. She looked like Christy Brinkley for Christy. And uh, she was a white girl and I'm Hispanic. And so some of my English, I guess, was a little silly sounding. And I was like, hey, let's go get something to eat. And I used the word sandwich but i didn't say it like sandwich i said and this is something i guess a lot of hispanics will understand sandwich with a g in there for some weird reason oh does that change the meaning of the word it does not it's a say it's a sandwich but uh because that's the way i've always heard it in my head when she heard that she burst out laughing and i was very super embarrassed i was so embarrassed but she was, that's not how you say it you say sandwich. It's not sang. What is a sandwich? I was so embarrassed. That's so. That's one one thing that pops to mind. So just so that myself and all of our listeners have this correct, <laughs> upon asking you for an embarrassing moment, you had to comb the depths of your mind to yes. go back to a time when you mispronounced a word in high school to deliver an yeah. answer. That is correct. Why that's- are you perfect? I don't know. It's just that way. <laughs> <laughs> One day you're going to slip up and I'm going to exploit your flaws for listens, just like I do for Rachel, just so you know. <laughs> Go for it. I'm ready. <laughs> He's ready. He says there's you? no such thing. How about you, Amanda? What's the most embarrassing thing for you? I did hear about a, a certain, uh, uh, was it a gas station guy? Oh, no. Did, <laughs> yeah, like, that wasn't really so much embarrassing, though, because it's just like crazy stuff happens. But yeah, no, I convulsed in front of a guy that I thought was attractive. Um, because it was cold already. And then like, you know, I got the feels or whatever. So he like, he grabbed, I I grabbed a bag from him and like our hand touched for a second and it made me like shiver a little. And it looked more like a, like a tremor. Like I was seizing and he didn't say anything. I could tell he noticed cause he like, he looked at me like I was like a lab instrument, like in a laboratory. Um, but he didn't say anything. And then I just fled the scene because I had no idea how to recover from that. Uh, so the lovely ladies of the suspended sentence podcast were supporting me on the last episode being like, this is what you should do. Um, and their recommendation is that I should go in there with a pill bottle filled with M&Ms and a fake label that says seizure medicine and walk in and hand it to him and be like, hee, 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 which is like, yeah, that would be cute if he remembered me right. and was like, oh, you're the girl who seized but there's also the possibility he doesn't remember me and that I'm a crazy lady who brought him a pill bottle of M&Ms to work. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> you know what would be awesome? If he's a listener. Wouldn't that be amazing? Um, I mean, it depends on your definition of amazing, but yeah. Like he that, knows, would, that would count as an embarrassing story. Every episode, he, he's checked out every episode and he has no idea it's you. <laughs> Well, he knows now, so he I don't even know now. his name. Random gas station guy. There you yeah. go. Now you know why I, I had yeah, to see yeah. it. We don't know. Could be yep. I'm not on drugs. I'm just cold and emotional. So. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great story. I love that. So that was a fun little icebreaker. Um, well, I don't know. What do you want to start with? Do you want to get right into our segments, or do we have time for for me to share like a little, a more recent embarrassing story? Please. Please. Okay. Share. It's got me thinking of embarrassing stories. So as you might know, well, I know that you do know this. I have a problem with interjecting myself into other situations that don't warrant my interjection. (laughs) I have a problem with that. And I'm trying to work on it. It's a me problem. I recognize that. Um, (laughs) So I was leaving a restaurant the other day because I DoorDash sometimes on the side just for extra money, you know. And I was picking up an order from a restaurant. And when I was leaving, there was a cockaroo on the door. Ooh. If you know what a cockaroo is, it's because the yeah. real word is real gross and I don't want to say it, but it's a gross insect p- people typically affiliate with like dirty conditions. Okay. Good. It's a cockaroo. Yeah. You with me? <laughs> yeah. It's like a water beetle. It's uh yeah. No, that, that bitch was a cockroach. I'm just, I don't want to oh. get right. Yeah. There was a cockroach on her door. I got you to say it. <laughs> I don't like it. 
It's just a gross word. And I, oh, they're so creepy crawly. I can't. It like gives me nightmares to even talk about them. But anyway, I saw like a little one on the door and it freaked me out. And mm-hmm. I want to say because I was in such a state of, of emotional duress that that's why I called the counter attendant over and showed her the door. But she couldn't see like the bug from where she was because it was small. So she was like walking up to me. But understandably, from her perspective, I was being hella sketchy. I was like, Psst, come here. No, come, come closer. Come here. Because I didn't want to yell it. Like, there's people dining in there. So from her perspective, there's a weird lady being like, Psst, Psst, come here to the door. So she's obviously apprehensive. And I'm like, I just need you to walk over here so I can show you something. So she doesn't come real close. She only walks a few feet. And I point like at the other side of the door where the bug is on the other side of the glass. So I point uh-huh. at it and I'm like, that's gross. Just wanted you to be aware. And yeah. then she looks at me with like an eyebrow up and she said, the handicap. And I was like, what? <laughs> and I turn around, David, through the glass into the parking lot <laughs> where there is a poor guy loading his wheelchair into his wheelchair van. And I think she thought I was pointing at him saying he was disgusting and that she should do something. Oh, my God. When I tell you, I just ran away again. I'm like, this is why I never I try so hard not to do it. But it's like in those situations, something comes over me and I can't help myself. That but yeah, so it's super embarrassing. I, I've declined every order that's taken me back to that restaurant since <laughs> I don't want to go back. She yeah, I'm cancel you. I don't, I was just trying to be helpful, but like, I didn't want to be loud about it. I would want like, I don't know. What if the next person who comes in, like, you know, ordered a hundred dollars worth of food and they see that, I don't know. I know it was on the outside of the door, but still, I would want to know if that were my restaurant, but I also understand how that came across as creepy and she had no idea what I was talking about. And at the end of the day, all I did was make her think that I'm intolerant of handicapped people and the bug still lived to eat another day. So I didn't do anything to help anybody. (laughs) <laughs> have weird out that lady and she probably told her co-workers later about that incident and she probably has a different perspective oh, of how that happened um but yeah no i can't go back there um <laughs> so that's yeah that's my more recent embarrassing story which is what prompted me to ask you about yours so i win <laughs> sorry yeah. you got it man that's a uh, oh ouch i know anyway so yeah, question of the week sound good? Let's just get on into it. Hit it. Kind of want to just get it out of the way because we have some in, we have some responses to this that I was not prepared for. And I do apologize. Um, I'm going to do my, my listener discretion warning a little early here. Um, yeah, some of these answers are not child appropriate. This podcast is marked explicit, so you can't bitch, but just be warning. Some, one in particular is, is rather distasteful. Okay. I didn't write it. I just have to read it. So question of the week was from episode 11, which was with the lovely women of Suspended Sentence Podcast, Samantha and Tracy. That was a great episode. David, you listened to it. Did you like it? Yes, I loved it. It was fantastic. Those girls are awesome. They they brought so much in terms of like mental health experience, and it was just really cool. Um, so the question was, what was, uh, what was the dumbest thing you've ever done for love? Because in episode 11, you know, our, our women victim did some pretty dumb stuff for the guy that she loved. So that's what prompted the question. Uh, David, do you want to talk about yours before I go on our submitted answers? Sure, sure. Yeah, uh, that I saw that question and I was just brought back to a, a moment in my life when I was dating this girl, which I won't name her. And we were, uh, I was living in Corpus Christi at the time in Texas and everything seemed to be going fine. There were some issues. There were, there were red flags, more red flags than green flags. I'll say that for sure. Uh, but you know, I was in love. And so we decided to move to San Antonio together. Somehow, uh, she moved up three months before I did. And when I finally got up there, she was seeing someone else who was also named David. And so she still tried to hold on to me, but I didn't want to deal with that. That's not, no, that wasn't me. So we broke up. I ended up uh, meeting someone else in San Antonio. Uh, We were together for four years and then we got married. And so totally together for 15 years. Then we got divorced, totally got divorced. And almost immediately uh, that girl from before came back into my life and she was married. And so she got divorced and we started, uh, we started up again. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, and so I, I was thinking, oh, well, I guess she is the one. But no, no. Same thing happened. So, yeah, that was the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life. So doing it twice, getting screwed over twice was not fun. Wow. Yeah, that sucks pretty bad. But I get it, though. Sometimes you're like, you know, what ifs get kind of take over and you, you know, do things you otherwise wouldn't. But at least you only made that mistake twice and not oh, twice. It's never yeah. happening a third time. I guarantee you that. That's what's up. You learn from it. That's good. That's right. So we have some other answers from some listeners um, who answered via TikTok and Instagram when I posted. Uh, Mr. Thursday Night said, get married. Um, (laughs) (laughs) The funny thing is that that dude's my ex. We were not married, though. (laughs) We just dated for very briefly. (laughs) But yeah, (laughs) how awkward. (laughs) Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, Warm, salty Coke. This is the one, guys. Just be prepared because I'm sorry. Warm, salty Coke had this to say about the dumbest thing he's done for love. He said he high-fived her and then beat off with that hand for three consecutive days without washing it. Thank you, Warm Salty Coke, for that imagery. So appreciate the fact that you made me say that on air. Warm Um, and salty. Very good name. Yeah. Stacey Johan, she said she got caught being intimate by LAPD because the woman was married. Oh. That sucks. We had Stark Rates who said trying drugs, which, yeah, that would be a dumb thing to do for love. I mean. Hopefully you um, stop drugs at some point. Yeah, that would be a smart thing to do. Yeah. And then Nulara, uh, this one came out of left field entirely. Nulara said, thank you. I'm really happy you make me archive in life. I must say you are a good man because you keep making me feel like I am on top of the world. Wow. I'm that good. I changed genders on this girl. Wow. Thanks, Nulara. I appreciate that nonsensical. I'm just going to assume that was one of those AI paragraphs to boost the algorithms. Thanks. <laughs> I'm right. <laughs> I just don't know. Okay, lots of fun. Okay, we're gonna do shout outs real quick. I'm gonna do them in like rapid fire succession because I heard you guys. I know they're too long. I get it. I just I'm full of warm, fuzzy feelings of love. I get it. But we're gonna do them real fast. Hopefully, whoever is in here can hear their name because I'm just gonna breeze through it. Obviously, David with Down the Rabbit Hole and Deeper Down Apparel. Kevin with Where the Weird Ones Are podcast. Brutal Bazaar and Boozy. BDBO podcast, Suspended Sentence podcast, Now About That, That Sort of Weird, Ghost Vexers Paranormal, Haunts podcast, The Conversation Cabin, Miss Spooky Obsessed, Hot Garbage True Tri- or little, little, Hot Garbage True Crime Pod, Can't Talk Fast, Women Who Podcast Magazine, Stacy Johan, Arnie Dixon, Eddie Lineberger, Paranormal Paradigma, the list could go on forever and ever and ever. There, are you happy? I am out of breath and I can't do the episode now. <laughs> As if. There's no limit to my ability to talk, believe me. So what what was the consensus on that? They they thought it was going too long? Well, I don't want to say they, but like two people messaged and were like, Ugh, it's kind of uh, hard to follow in the beginning because your shout outs are like, they encompass like seven or eight minutes of time. And I'm like, yeah, I get that. It's just, I have a lot of people that I like to say nice things about. So. Ooh-hoo. Right. We're going to try it this way. At least you guys heard your names. I just, I don't know. I feel like it's important to show my gratitude, this, especially this early on when I'm like very baby in the podcast world. I want the people who went out of their way to support me to know that I appreciate it. So that's why I do it. If y'all don't like it, you can suck a wiener because I'm going to keep doing them. So. Yeah, definitely. I agree. You need to, you need to do that. I, I do that a lot. I try to, to share the love because, you know. You always, most- you're always tagging me and stuff too. Like I really appreciate that. Yeah, take your time, man. Okay, we'll try this one time, and then we'll see what they say after this. And if uh, no one complains, we'll do it the old way. I guess so, yeah. And if you guys like the old way, let me know, because I like saying nice things about you guys. It is not hard. I can find all of the sweet words for you guys in the world if everybody just shuts up and listens to them. Well, before we get into the story, um, again, I just want to drop a couple of the things that we've been working on with the podcast lately. So we did a collaboration with another podcast recently. If you couldn't guess, it was the Suspended Sentence podcast. So they came on my show and we did an episode and then I went on their show and did an episode and we we dropped our episodes the same day um, because we we're just gluttonous and we can't help ourselves. So it was a lot of fun. Um their episode was amazing. They did one on the Winchester Ranch, and they found an episode about a guy who murdered his family, two sets of families, actually, that he had um, via pigs that he kept, that he essentially fed it. So it was really wild. They picked a really good episode to bring me on. I was just so enthralled listening the whole time to them talk. I was like, oh, my gosh, they're really great at what they do. So check that out. It's called the Winchester Ranch. They're on Apple Podcasts. 
Um, Kevin, where the weird ones are again, episode 41. My audio sucks in it. I need a new computer to get over it. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you want to buy me one, <laughs> I'll stop complaining. Uh, not you, David. I meant like the general public. Um, although, you know, <laughs> what? I'm episode 42. Yeah, Before David's episode 42. So listen to both of them. Do some binging because they're both really great. David's is crazy too. There was stuff I learned about you that I didn't know but from listening to that. And you could yep. learn it too if you want to know about our Davey. Check it out. Check um, it out. We did the wrap up on Virginia City with the Paranormal Project, which is the collaboration that we do with Courtney from Haunts, Fair from the Conversation Cabin, and Vicky from Miss Spooky Obsessed. Yes, um, yes. Vicky and I teamed up on the Mizpah Hotel in Tonopah, Nevada, which is super haunted and creepy. And we picked our next series, segments, topics, whatever, that we're going to be doing on the next one. And we're doing different kinds of aliens. And I drew Nordic aliens. I knew nothing about Nordic aliens. So I'm excited for that research and to bring you guys everything that I know. So if you are into the paranormal or the cryptic or whatever, check out that because that's our little collab that we do with the paranormal. Are they the Um, uh, tall, blonde, beautiful looking aliens? So I'm not going to lie to you. I don't. I haven't done that much research yet. I've been really overwhelmed with a lot of the other stuff that I've been doing. But mm-hmm. um, from what I, I've seen like a couple of Google images searches and they do appear that way. They look like mm-hmm. almost like Aryan race kind of stuff. Sweet. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. I'm excited to learn more about them and broaden my own knowledge and horizon. Um, what else did we get into? Oh yeah. The next episode that we have, which is going to be episode 13. Um, we have another podcast that we're collaborating with a different one that's not been on our show before. So that's really exciting. Um, really pumped their true crime podcast. I will give you that hint. So we're going to double up on a really gnarly episode and our next episode just so happens to be a swap. So normally we go, you know, murder, animal attack, freak exit, whatever, It's kind of like a combo of kind of all three. So I'm really pumped to see what you guys think about that. Um, Lastly, we are 19 countries now. We grew by two more. So we're in 19. We also landed spot 192 in the UK podcast chart. I'm not sure how many podcasts are on that chart, but we broke a chart in another country. That's the second chart that we've landed on. We were number 30 in Pakistan a couple months ago. Now we're... um, that's just crazy to me. We're not 192 in all of the UK. So thank yeah. you, our United Kingdom listeners, for popping us up on the charts. Very cool. Um, I want to remind everyone one last, uh, not one last time. I'm going to keep talking about it. I want to remind everybody, we're still trying to push to collect donations for Jeremy Evans. Um, he has a project that he's working on to raise money to help provide and broaden access to PTSD treatments for people in need. Um, Jeremy Evans was our uh, bear attack survivor from episode 10, our first one something mini series episode. So if you haven't already heard that, go check it out. It is crazy brutal. David, I think you just listened to that one today. I heard that one today and it was amazing. That guy is something else, man. Crazy. Yeah, he's, I have no words. Odd, Like you said, just something else entirely. Uh, but he's helping, hoping to raise money to help broaden this access to PTSD treatment. Um, I'd really like to thank him for taking his time joining us on our podcast by helping to raise money. So for everyone who donates $25 or more, send me a screenshot of your donation and you're going to get some special little treats. I'm going to throw you on a sneak peek shout out for the next episode. So you're going to get all the sneak details of the episode before anybody else. I'm going to give you shout outs on Instagram, TikTok, and our podcast episodes. Um, And I'm going to send you sneak peeks to our trailers too for the episodes for the next couple ones. So quite a cool little VIP access all for 25 bucks or more. Um, wow. Yeah. And Good. there is, I am tossing around potentially sometime in the near future um, doing a drawing for anyone who donates maybe like 50 or $75 or more getting thrown into a ring and then pulling a drawing and whoever wins gets to take over one nothing podcast for a day. So really? that's something I've been throwing around too. And they get to be the host, talk about whatever they want, do whatever they want for the segments. Um, so that's something that anyone feels interested in in let me know i would love to do it but i don't want to do it if there's only going to be like two people donating i want it you know to be fruitful so we're trying to help this guy we're trying to help people with ptsd go to grizzlydude.ca if you would like to donate he also has a ton of merchandise i bought his book he signs every copy so go buy it it's amazing for sure david do you have any shout outs or anything that you want to talk about or anything you want to say before we get into this I do. Uh, I got a shout out here for my good friend, Arnie uh, El Hontino on 
Instagram? Arnie Dixon. Yay, yay. We love Arnie. Uh, let's see. Uh, let me see if I say this right. Paranormal Paradigma. She's fantastic. Her name's Debbie. Follow her. She's great. Uh, Heal with Christina, my good friend, Witchy Paranormal. Uh, she's awesome. There's Callie. Uh, there's also Gina. She haunts. Callie is, uh, I believe her tag is uh, Haunted Barbie. She's amazing. These guys are great. They're all part of South Florida. So is Arnie. Uh, Haunted South Florida. They have these events. They're really great. I uh, have a good friend of mine, Kevin, which we just talked about, where the weird ones are. His podcast is amazing, guys. you got to check that out. He is great. Uh, one of my buddies, like when I first started this about eight months ago, nine months ago now, uh, at Grave Evidence, his name is Ron. He is fantastic. He's a ghost hunter. And I follow a lot of ghost hunters. i got 305 Paranormal. Those guys I've are I've heard good things about them. I follow yeah, them too. JJ uh, Paranormal is another thing. Joy, she's amazing. Bobby Shue. Bobby's great. He's he's got a Mystic Talk podcast. Um, uh, oh, I, I, I don't want to forget anyone. I'm thinking um, uh, one of one of my favorite podcasts is Let's Get Freaky with Tommy Cullum. He's Tommy amazing. Cullum. Yes. He's done a few episodes on Tommy's show. I, I love his yeah, show. You guys have a really great dynamic. He is cool. I love that guy. Uh, man, I wish. I hope I'm not missing anyone. Uh, but yeah, I, I, there's a lot of really good people in this paranormal community that we're a part of but thank you thank you for letting me do that appreciate it i know i'm so glad that you had a lot of people that you were able to shout out and some of those names i'd never heard of so i'm going to go back later and there's an angry bird interrupting my podcast right now i don't know if you can hear him out there but he's like me 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 in the background i'm trying to talk um but no those are really awesome shout outs super cool Um, I do want to drop real quick that we were originally going to do this episode with our sweet friend, Rachel, who just texted me back. Um, She took a nap. So she's alive and well. I just wanted to update David because we were worried for a second. Um, But no, she's good. She just overslept. So all is well. You're in trouble, Rachel. (laughs) No, she's in trouble. (laughs) Oh, goodness. Well, I don't want to take up all of your – well, I do want to take up all your night. But I'm not going to because I'm not going to be mean. But um, we're going to do our – graphic material warning real quick. As you know, if you've listened to us before, the content we're going to cover in this episode is for adult audiences only. This episode will contain graphic language, especially if you know me, Um, descriptions of a death, descriptions of a dead body, foul, you know, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Listener discretion is advised. If I even dream of a child being in the room with you for this, I will do nothing because I don't know where you live, but I will judge you extensively. So please get your kids out. Yes. You don't want her judging you. No, you don't. I'm a good judger. Let me tell you. Judgy McJudger fan. (laughs) Okay. Are you all settled in and ready for this one? Yes. Okay. So today's story is a little bit ironic only because the topic has kind of been in the news lately. Um, And it's not what you think, but it's similar. So we're going to go back a little to July of 1949. We're going to travel to a city on the west coast of Norway called Bergen. So Bergen, Norway. We better get some Norway listeners after this. I want to see Norway on the map. Anyway, in this beautiful city of Bergen lives a wonderful couple by the name of Esther and Harry. And as you can imagine, this July day is a big deal for Esther and Harry. Anyone want to guess what happens? You want to guess? Mm, they got married they had a baby very close they have a baby um a blonde haired bouncing baby boy is brought into the world and given the name trolls helovic the name ring any bell for you no good good little trolls his parents are over the moon and before long either before or after his birth i really couldn't find but at some point Esther and Harry have another baby boy that they name Lars. So they have two little boys, growing up typical family. There's very little information, obviously, since they grew up in like the 50s about their childhood. Um, But I would imagine that trolls grew up like any other boy in Norway, you know, maybe playing some sports throughout his school years or getting into teenage trouble with his brother, finding different passions as he learned about who he was. We can only postulate. But as he grows into a young man, we do begin to learn a little bit more about him. 
He grows up, in fact, to become quite the handsome guy. He's got a full head of blonde locks and a dark mustache that touches the ends of his wide smile. He's got a pretty good smile. And he decides for whatever reason at that point of his life that he wants to enter the career of oil drilling. I don't know Mm -hmm. why. I don't know what started his role in this industry. But for whatever reason, he apparently is really good at it. um, And he's excelling in this career choice that he's made for himself. Also, he meets a beautiful woman whose name seemingly doesn't exist. I'm sure it does, but I couldn't find her name anywhere. Uh, They fall in love, eventually get married, and they have two beautiful Norwegian children of their own. Happy little life. All is good. Um, Trolls continues to advance in his career and begins exploring uh, another level of his job by becoming a saturation diver. Now, David, do you know anything about saturation diving? No, I don't. I'm excited to be able to tell you because I did not either before this. I had no idea. So saturation diving is often considered one of the deadliest and most dangerous jobs that exists. Mm -hmm. Divers are extremely professional divers who will travel to some pretty deep parts of the ocean that so that they can work on and repair drilling equipment and undersea pipelines. These divers can dive as deep as a thousand feet. And I know recently we had the Titan in the news and that was at what 12 K feet. So like doesn't a thousand feet doesn't seem that deep. But keep in mind, these these guys are in specialized diving suits, you know, working with their hands. They're not driving submersible little cars made out of the bargain bin at Lowe's. You know, they're like, they're <laughs> just wearing suits, essentially. So it's considerably more pressure and oh, understandably yeah. considerably more dangerous. And you really rely on your coworkers in this job to keep you alive. Like, you might ask yourself, why would anyone even want to do that kind of job? Well, saturation divers can gross between thirty to $45,000 a month. And there wow. are bonuses for the deeper that you have to work. Like you're literally paid between one to four dollars extra for each foot of depth beyond a certain depth. So they get paid very well. Yeah. Now, do you happen to know what a problematic issue with deep sea diving could be? Uh, the bends. Yeah, good job. Decompression sickness, also called the bends. So this happens when we dive to deep depths that have a really heavy water pressure and then we bring, like, come up to the surface really quickly what happens when we do this as we're diving the literal weight of all of the ocean around us is increasing more and more with every foot that you dive so that pressure is increasing eventually this pressure is creating enough you know like oh, enough weight on your body that your cells begin to compress and your oxygen and your nitrogen molecules and your tissues actually compress so they get smaller And because they're smaller than normal, they dissolve faster, and that leaves them dissolved in higher concentrations. This on its own isn't really the problem. However, you can't live at the bottom of the ocean. You have to, at some point, come back up. That's where the problem comes. If you rise too quickly, all of that dissolved nitrogen in your tissues, that rapid drop in the pressure causes those molecules to inflate and bubble. So your blood will literally boil. Ugh. Yeah. Not necessarily from heat, but it's boiling all the same. And this is a life-threatening scenario. It's very painful. It's a lot of the time paralyzing. People who suffer from the bends are you know, often extremely confused with cognitive issues. They even die a lot of the times. And the treatment, ironically, is stuffing the person back into a pressure chamber. If anyone remembers our Erica Marshall episode in her hyperbaric ch- pressure chamber, similar concept. But they throw them in one of those, increase the pressure, and then reduce it again, but very slowly. This is a very long and painstakingly miserable process for anyone who has to go through it. And it's recommended that for every 100 feet of seawater that you descend, it takes a full day to decompress from that. So if you're a, a diver and you're diving down to 650 feet to fix this you know, oil pipeline, Theoretically, it should take you eight days to recover from that, just to be able to walk around on land at our normal atmospheric pressure. So it's it's a lot. It's very grueling. So we're going to put a pin in that, and we're going to go back to trolls. I'm surprised that he could even do this job with balls of steel that heavy. But at any point, at some point, he lands this job with this company. And the company is called Dolphin Drilling. And they are a subsidiary of the Fred Olson Energy Company. This company is a pretty prevalent presence at this point in the oil drilling industry. I couldn't really find out when he joined the company, um, but in 1972, the company has one of their most notable dates. And 1972 is the year that they began this massive multi-million dollar project of building a semi-submersible drilling rig. So it only takes them two years. In 1974, it brings the completion of this expensive, huge project to, to completion. 
The Dolphin Drilling Company officially puts this rig out for service. The company registers this thing out of Hamilton, Bermuda, and they have really high hopes, like dollar signs just scrolling in their eyes. They're like, this bad bitch is going to bring us to the top because <laughs> it's a big deal for its time. You know, fuck the oceans and the environment, but we're going to be rich, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. so they named this thing the Biford Dolphin. And I'm going to pause before I move on here real quick because, David, I'm going to send you a picture of it. And for everyone listening, head over to Instagram or TikTok. I've made a post with a title that says Interactive Episode 12. Click on it. I'm going to, It's kind of going to allow you to follow along with us and see what we're talking about as we talk about it because a lot of this stuff is really hard uh, to, to visualize. So, David, I'm sending you over two images right now of okay. the – this Got huge it. rig that they put out. So it's Got enormous. It. I mean, it's really, it's quite intimidating to just like yeah. see how large it is and realize that human hands actually assembled that. And they named this thing, the Biford dolphin. And it is, I mean, do you have it? Are you looking at the image right now? Yeah, checking it out right now. Yeah, it's, it's huge. Uh, so I see like just a, is this like a normal oil rig? Or is this something we have out today, right? So um, we do have versions of this rig out today, but this is a deep sea drilling rig. So this is very particularly created for a sole purpose of drilling through deep sea floors in search of oil and gas under the, the, the sea floor. So these okay. things are like, today they're much different now. They have a lot of different protocols as we'll talk about, but this was like the first of its class in its time. This was a big deal for oil companies because they had this ability now you know, to do this. So let's talk about the Biford Dolphin a little because it has its own history. So this giant column stabilized oil rig, it sits at about 355 feet long. Uh, as it sits at the surface, the entire length of it sits or sinks about 120 feet deep into the ocean. So it's kind of bobbing. Um, when it's full at its max weight, it weighs over 11,000 gross tons. When it's empty, it's around 4,000 gross tons. Huge. This thing does have its own engines. It could actually travel on its own at a speed of 4.5 knots, which equals out to about five miles an hour, or for our friends outside of the United States, about eight kilometers an hour. Mm -hmm. This Goliath can move on its own with its own engines at a very small pace, but for larger travels, like if it needs to move to a different part of the ocean, a specialized tugboat will come out and move it place to place. At any given time, there can be 102 crew hands on staff helping to keep it operational, and it's completely self-sufficient. It sits way out in the deep ocean where it can drill through the seafloor to the untouched rations of oil that exist below. It's usually seated at or near the surface of the water, and it has a main chamber area inside that serves as like a little housing unit for divers. Within the rig is like a diving bell, which is basically just an elevator that brings you from the chamber at the surface to the bottom of the ocean and back. So it's like a little ocean elevator. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. And this is how, how these divers do their work on these pipelines. You know, they'll go back to the hub when they're done. This whole machine itself can actually operate in the water at depths of 1,500 feet. But the drill portion of this rig itself can reach depths of 20,000 feet. That, my friends, puts even the Titanic to shame. 20,000 feet is a ridiculous depth. Absolutely. So as I said, for its time, this first of its class oil drilling machine – you know, subsequent models were put out into operation following it, but it was like a, a huge deal. The Biford Dolphin worked for a number of companies in the British, Danish, and Norwegian sectors of the North Sea. And the machine also has, I'm getting text now, I can't, focus, leave me alone, scammers. They're probably not scammers, they're probably bill collectors, who knows. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> Throughout its time, uh, the Biford worked for a number of companies in different sectors of the North Sea. And the coolest feature of this is I actually want to see if you can suss it out. So after learning all about this rig and saturation divers and, you know, what some of the problems of saturation diving could be, what do you think would be the least profitable part out of this? The least profitable part? I don't so know. Having this set up where you have like this little house where your divers kind of stay and they dive down to the deep ocean and they come back. What would be like a unprofitable part of you know having a a field where your employees are doing that death i don't know they die well, death is pretty rate. unprofitable you're not wrong <laughs> <laughs> what 
Well, I'm trying to help you, but I'm putting out the bait. (laughs) (laughs) So the unprofitable part of it is that, you know, decompression divers, like, you know, they can't stay down there forever and you're, you can't pay. Well, I mean, you could pay, but they're not going to pay a guy to make one trip down to the ocean and then rest for a week after every trip. Think how many divers you'd have to employ to keep, I mean, repairs are daily. You'd have to have constant stream of divers go in and recovering and diving and recovering for a week at a time at the depths that these guys are diving. So very unprofitable to do that. So the Bifurk Dolphin, they got a workaround for that. They thought of everything. These smarty little smarties, they thought of everything. So it was built with this thing to prevent from having to spend days decompressing divers after every trip down. So what they would do... It's actually wild to think about right now that there's people diving in the ocean working on oil lines right now as we speak. There's probably someone like a thousand feet below our feet right now working on an oil line. That's just weird. Anyway, my ADD brain kicking in. Um, But this feature of the Bifurk Dolphin is that it is specifically built to allow for a pressurization and depressurization. So imagine how that would be useful. Yeah. Yeah. uh, Reduce the need for extra divers exactly so what they do is they would have this main chamber which was like a housing area where the divers would kind of hang out you know while they weren't doing their work and it was pressurized so that way when they send the divers down it's the same atmospheric pressure at the bottom of the ocean as it is at the surface in their little chambers that they're in so they can stay under this pressure for days at a time before they have to decompress so now instead of having one trip and decompressing for a week you can work for a week and then just decompress for a week or two it's just far more profitable less divers that are on hand less trips you have to make to you know go to the hospital when your decompression thing doesn't work whatever just more convenient for the company more profitable you know yeah. a lot more money to be made Kind of messed up, but even saturation divers are just glitter on a cog of the same slave machine that we're all a part of. So don't think they're any different. (laughs) But essentially, these divers would live at the pressure of nine atmospheres for a week or more at a time before having to recover. Like, Can you imagine walking outside and gravity being nine times heavier? No. That's crazy. I guess you're living under 295 feet of water. Wow. That's a lot. I'm just walking around like that. So obviously fatigue is a serious concern in this field of work because you get tired. It's exhausting just to exist at that pressure, let alone the recovery of decompression every time you spend, you know, time down there. It's very grueling. It is not easy on the body. Tough job for sure. Not for me. Could you do that job? No, I don't think so. I could not do that. I wouldn't want to. You spend away from your family too. Yeah, that's another thing. Yeah, they're not seeing their family for a while at a time. Good point. Not cool. So just two years into its operation, March 1st, 1976, the Biford Dolphin makes headlines and not for good reasons. <laughs> the giant submersible, well, sorry, semi-submersible, it actually runs aground into Bergen and the crew all evacuated safely, but there were six people that were knocked off their boats in the process that all perished. So yeah. for good reason, the people that are operating this are like kind of being called into question. Like, how the fuck do you drive a, a machine the size of a small planet out of the ocean? Like, is there not enough space for you out there? <laughs> I don't understand how that how, how does that happen. Like, it moves on its own. Is someone not aware of where it was going? It moves at, like, five miles an hour, and they're like, oh, wait, there's land over there. Let's wait and see what happens. So what I don't happened? Know how, that, how it would happen. But, yeah, it ran aground and killed six people. So, yeah, bye for dolphin looking hot. So we're going to jump forward to November 5th of 1983. Our guy Trolls is back in the picture. He's been working for this company for a while. Everything's good. He's good at his job. He's working with his team, doing some repairs. Um, and now I'm going to send you, a, maybe, oh, there it is. Now I'm going to send you a picture of an aerial map. And um, it's like, you know, bird's eye view looking down. Okay. So sending that over to you now. Got it. So this is an aerial view of the Biford Dolphin and of the divers working at that time. Again, you guys who are listening, head over to Instagram or TikTok to follow along. If you need to pause it here, you can just search One Nothing Podcast on Instagram or TikTok. Give us a follow while you're there. Um, But I'm going to post all these photos, so go through it. This is going to be the photo. Um, You'll see Chamber 1, Chamber 2 labeled at the top. If you don't have access to social media, you can grab a pen and draw this out if you want to understand it better. I really was diligent in making sure that I said this. I'm not not trying to talk to you like you're dumb, but it took me a while to to grasp 
what happens. So I'm just trying to walk you guys through it the same way. So yeah, I'm looking at it right now. I'm like, what? Yeah, it's confusing to yeah. look at. And it was even when I knew it happened, it was confusing to wrap my brain around it. So now that I have a good, clear understanding, I'm really going to try to work to help you guys get it the first time. So you're not left like what? Because I was like, I read like 20 articles and I'm like, this still doesn't make sense to me. So, <laughs> so we're on our aerial view of the Biford dolphin. Um, for our chambers, you guys can draw, for people who are drawing this, you can draw the chambers as boxes. You can draw hallways as rectangles, draw doors, however you want, little like lines, whatever. We're doing aerial, so you're from above looking down through the roof of the Bifur Dolphin. I feel like I'm doing too much, but I'm just trying to help you understand. So as if you're flying in the air looking down, you can see that we have two divers, D1, D2, and they're kind of laying down in chamber two. And so they're not yeah. dead, they're sleeping, they're just resting. They've finished their dive and they're resting. So that's D1 and D2. And uh, these divers are Edwin Arthur Coward, who was 35, and Roy P. Lucas, who's 38. They're hanging out in Chamber 2, getting ready for whenever their shift starts so they could pick up. Um, to the right of Chamber 1, we see two divers in Chamber 1. Chamber 1's attached to Chamber 2 via a little hallway that has doors. We'll talk about all that in a second. To the right of Chamber 1 is another little area that serves as the exit to get out. So there's, like, exit to, like, a a little boat or something, I don't know, a lifeboat, I think, some kind of escape pod. Um, so you have three little rectangles in a row, chamber two on the left, chamber one in the middle, the escape popsule on the right. Is everybody with me? Yes. Okay. Uh, connected to the front of chamber one, so that rectangle in the middle, is a door that leads into a trunk. So we're going to look at that like a hallway. And that serves as the area that leads to the diving bell. The diving bell is a round capsule. Again, think of it as an elevator. The divers will crawl through the trunk into the bell, get in there, and the bell goes down to the ocean floor. They go down there. They do all their stuff. Um, but they have to be pressurized correctly because that bell is departing the trunk. So everything has its own little pressure system. Okay. So we're going to talk about the – you're going to ignore the red clamp for now that you see on there as well. We'll get to that in a sec. But we're going to talk about the Bifurt Dolphins pressurization protocol and why it was necessary. We know the divers have to remain at nine atmospheres in order to not get sick from the bends because it's nine atmospheres where they're working at the bottom of the ocean. So we also know you can't just wing a door open to a place when it's sitting at the surface, which is one atmosphere of pressure, when it's pressurized to nine atmospheres. There has to be a way to change the pressure to increase or decrease it. The trunk serves as that function. So the main housing, which is the chambers and the exit room, they're all pressurized at nine atmospheres. The bell is pressurized as well, but they don't really have a way to perfectly seal the bell to the chamber to allow their employees in and out or their divers in and out. So the trunk has to be pressurized too. So what they do, we're going to walk step by step through their protocol. Step one, they would walk from the bell, which is that round part at the bottom of that map, through the trunk, which is that hallway. That's step one, okay? Leaving their mm. wet equipment and crap in the bell. Step two, we're going to close the door to the bell that leads to the trunk. So that door that we just walked out of to get out of the bell, we're closing that door, okay? And now we're going to increase the pressure inside the bell a little bit, just enough to pressurize that door shut. So we're just increasing the pressure to push the door shut tight. Now, is this in the clamp area or the, the door to chamber one? So the clamp area, just ignore that for a moment. Just pretend that clamp part doesn't exist. We're just no. closing. That clamp is a door underneath that. It's hard to see, but just envision that as a door. So they're closing that door to pressurize mm. the bell. So the trunk is open, the chambers are open, but the door to the bell is closed. Okay. Step three of the protocol is to move from the trunk into chamber one. So now we're walking through that second door that you see open right by D4 on the map. Once they get in there, they are to shut that door and slowly depressurize the trunk so that the little hallway that you walk through to get from the bell to the chamber is down to one atmosphere of pressure, which is what you and I and all of us exist in normally. Mm -hmm. The final and fifth step is for the diving tenders, which are labeled as T1 and T2 on the image, to open that red clamp, um, okay. which is appearing on the map as a red line. That essentially detaches the bell from the rest of the chambers so that the trunk isn't pressurized, just the chambers are. The trunk is regular pressure, the chambers are pressurized. Everyone still with me? Is it just me? Is it just me that's dumb? Everyone else is with me? No, I, I think I get it. It's, okay. It's, it's, <laughs> I think I get it, yeah. 
So now that we understand the protocol of how to properly pressurize and depressurize the bell, let's proceed with November 5th. So this is a Saturday, and it's about 4 in the morning. And this particular day, the Bifurd Dolphin is out drilling in an area called the Frigg Gas Field, which is located in the Norway sector of the North Sea. Trolls, who is 34 by now, and his co-worker Bjorn Giver, who is 29 at this point, they're finishing up a grueling 13-hour shift working on the oil lines in the depths of the North Sea. So they get into the bell, put all their equipment in, up they go some hundreds of feet into the main chamber connected to the trunk. So Trolls and Bjorn pull off their tools and drop them into the trunk and start initiating the beginning steps of that pressurization protocol. So they start off correctly, they close the bell door like step one, and then they slowly increase the pressure of the bell to seal that door shut. So now we're going to hover on this for just a second. So the divers have finished their dive and they're working through the steps. They've completed step one and step two. Everything is going to plan. Let's look at this image again. You can see two other divers that we have in chamber one, D4 and D3. They are not the same ones that are resting in chamber two. These are Trolls and Bjorn. Trolls is D4. He's standing in the doorway of the trunk in the chamber, getting ready to close it for the next step so they can continue with depressurizing the trunk. Outside of the diving bell, actually in the water outside of the uh, machine, are two diving tenders. You can think of them like assistants to the divers. And their names are 32-year-old William Crammond and Martin Saunders. And their whole purpose is to wait for the command to remove that clamp, which detaches the bell from the trunk. And they are to wait for instruction because they're outside of the trunk. They can't see the pressure inside of the trunk. Only the people that are in the chambers can view those pressure gauges. So they have to really rely on the people inside to tell them when it's time to pull that clamp so that they can reduce that pressure. For reasons that nobody knows to this day... Crammond, one of the diving tenders, does not await the signal, and he opens the clamp that's keeping the trunk attached to the bell. The problem is, Troll hasn't closed the door and completed step three yet from the chamber to the trunk. This happens in an instant. It takes 0.1 to 0.5 seconds, faster than the blink of an eye. But as soon as an opening in that pressurized trunk was created by opening that clamp, All of the chambers and the trunk rapidly and instantaneously decompress from nine atmospheres to one. Air rushes out with such brutal and impressive force that it actually jams the interior trunk door, the one that Trolls was in front of closing. And it does so with such force that it actually pushes the bell away from the trunk, like with tremendous force, actually ejects it out. So the two divers in the chamber two, Coward and Lucas, and Trolls' co-worker that he was just diving with, Bjorn, all three are dead before they have any idea of what happened. Upon autopsy, they were all found to have large clumps of solid, like like solid clotted fat in their veins and their arteries, which was really bizarre. They'd not seen that before, but it was consistent in all three of them. Upon further examination, it was determined that their blood essentially flash boiled, which cooked the lipids in their blood, which just basically makes it look like fat on a steak. Like it just clumps up and it Good sits in all other things. Yeah. So there, there are four people in those chambers though, right? You're saying three people died? What happened to the Three people one? died that way. So we haven't talked about trolls yet, but the other three that are in the chambers, they all are flash boiled immediately. Wow. That's their cause of death. The two... Um, no, oh, sorry. My boss probably was. The bell, after ex- like explosively being ejected from the trunk, it kills William Crammon, who was the tender that opened the, cramp, the mm. clamp. <laughs> and it seriously injures Martin, which was the other tender. Martin does live, amazingly. Worst of the casualties, though, was our poor, innocent friend, Trolls Helovic. Sending another picture, David. <laughs> this one's not gory, I promise, but I do want to give you an idea of what the door looked like. So the door that Trolls is standing in front of before the clamp is opened, for those who aren't looking at it, try to imagine looking at a manhole cover on the ground, like the round ones. Now imagine pulling the lid up and laying it on the ground beside the manhole and having some kind of a a hinge where you can just kind of swing it over the cover and swing it back out. So it's kind of how these work, right? Kind of push them in, push them out. They're round doors with handles and you just glide them into place, and then lock them, pressurize them. So convenient, you know? Yeah. Trolls is in the process of shutting this door to chamber one to the trunk. So it was almost shut. So it looks how it does a little bit less, but it looks approximately like what it does in the image. 
So it creates like a crescent shaped opening made by the circular door covering the majority of the circular entry. This measures about 24 inches long and as its widest was just four inches wide. So the crescent from top to bottom, 24 inches at the widest part of the little opening, four inches wide. This pressure exchange happened so quickly and our guy, he was just in the worst place at the worst time. The pressure from the chambers that was pushing through the trunk, through the block door, forces trolls through the opening. In less than a second, his entire body is pushed through that tiny little opening. And oh my- you ever had one of those Play-Doh toys growing up that you like put a piece of Play-Doh in and then squeeze it and it like makes shapes? Yeah. 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 That's what happened to him? I mean, pretty much. Uh, pretty much. So I'm going to read the description that I found that describes this better than I could. So I'm going to quote this from the autopsy report. Okay. The pressure resulted in a bisection of the thoracoabdominal cavity, resulting in fragmentation of the body, expulsion of all internal organs apart from the trachea and some small intestines, and parts of his body were projected with such force that his spine was located 30 feet vertically above the pressure exterior door. The only parts of him that weren't located were the top of his head and his brain. And they think that that just simply liquefied. So some of you think like imagining this might be struggling to be like, how did this would have happened? So I found a really convenient metaphor that I want to repeat because it really does help envision it. So imagine if you will, that you have a balloon and you've attached it to a pump and you're inflating the balloon. So with every push of the pump, that balloon is getting bigger And the pressure is building, which is what is stretching the latex, causing it to grow larger and larger and larger. Now, imagine you have a real big balloon and it slips off the pump. What happens? It flies through the air with a fart sound, right? Yeah. So imagine the chambers as the balloon, but instead of flying away because of its sheer mass, it couldn't. It kind of whooshed out of it. And that's what blasted the bell away is act like, you know, just hold the balloon and let it go. And all of that air that rushes out of it. That magnified by like a bajillion essentially is what happened when they created that opening for that pressure to escape. I'm going to tell you now, the picture from all of their autopsies exists. The other three aren't so bad. They, they just look like, you know, can, they, they're dead. You can tell, but they don't look that bad. Um, trolls, there is a horror movie somewhere about a monster that sucks out your skeleton or something or like liquefies your skeleton and leaves you like a heap of loose, squishy flesh. I can't uh-huh. remember what the movie is called. Maybe somebody listening can let me know. But that's pretty much what his autopsy photo looks like. Um, it's mm-hmm. not hard to find. Literally, if you search his name on Reddit, it'll pop up immediately. All I'm saying is it's awful. Um, it's it's a really disturbing. I wanted to save it, but I don't want that on my phone, if I'm being honest. I don't want that. In, I don't need the karma that comes with putting that in my library. So I'm not going to save it. I'm not going to post it on Instagram. But if you guys want to see it, it's out there for you to find. Um, yeah, look it autopsy- up. What's that? I said, yeah, look it up. Yeah, look it up. I don't want to be the one to, to put that in your head. It's pretty brutal. It's an old photograph, but it's fucked up, man. I'll tell you. I can imagine. I, I can actually see it in my mind, and it, it oh, it looks like he his everything inside is kind of he looks deflated, right? In my yeah. that's what I'm saying in my head. He's deflated because his skeletal system and everything. He's missing his brain. I mean, oh my god. Everything got just kind of pushed out and his skin was like, parts of his skin were left intact, but it's, so yeah. Can, it's, can, we, can I ask you a question? Yeah. I'm guessing it's T1 was the guy, right? Who opened it, opened the clamp before he should have. So what, what's his name I again? couldn't find on this image, which one was Crammond. I want to say based on the image, which I'll send you here of the clamp, it looks like it would have been T2 because it looks like the clamp would have been on like the right side of the trunk. I'm going to send the picture of what the, of the, what the clamp looks like. It's just like a little, little cover with like a flippy top. Got it. Yeah. Um, but okay. that was what, yeah. That was what essentially like released the suction from the trunk. So that's what he opened. But I want to say because of where it looks, I don't know. I want to say that T2 would make more sense, but I don't know. I couldn't really find which diver. All I know for sure is which one Trolls was, which was D4 because of obviously how they found him in the door. So I feel bad for that guy because he made obviously a very deadly mistake. But I I don't, oh, I, I don't know. I kind of feel like he died, right? Almost immediately. 
Everyone sure. died, but Saunders and everyone died before that they could. I mean, it happened so fast before they before the pain signal would have made it to the brain. They were dead, so they didn't feel anything. I do feel bad for Saunders, which was the tender that survived because he was pretty critically injured and had a long recovery, and he was the only surviving person. So, like, that's pretty messed up. Um, and I'm sure he saw, you know, trolls. There was a lot of him all over the place, so I'm sure he saw. And that oh. probably fucked them up pretty good. So I feel actually the worst for him just because, you know, everybody else died so quickly. I still feel bad that they died, but, like, if they didn't feel it, they didn't suffer at least, you know. Jeez. That is crazy. It's pretty rough. Mm. Um, the autopsy report does go on in a little more detail to reveal the true carnage of Trolls' remains. I'm going to quote this next part from the report mainly because I spent hours searching for it and your damn skippy I'm putting it in here because I found the damn thing. So I, I worked way too hard for it. And I want my cookie. So, and I had to translate a bunch of stuff into English from Norwegian to make sure that it was accurate because there's a lot of stuff out there that wasn't. So right. this, what I'm about to read is from an article called an explosive decompression accident. And it was published in the American Journal of Forensic Medicine and Pathology in 1988 by a number of doctors who I'll list in my sources at the end because it's like seven of them. I'm going to quote this from the article. Warning, it's gross. Duh, look where you are. <laughs> That's not quoted from the article. That's me. But <laughs> I'm quoting this next part from the article. So again, this is from the article portion titled Postmortem Examinations. So this is from the uh, coroner, I guess, that did the exam. The remains of Diver 4, or as we know, trolls, were sent to us in four plastic bags. Ugh. All parts showed fractures and wounds. The fractures of the long bones were of transverse as well as short and long oblique types, the fracture lines being more irregular than usual, with small splintered fragments. The scalp with long blonde hair was present, but the top of the skull and the brain were missing. The base of the skull was just a collection of tiny bone fragments only, and the soft tissues of the face were found. However, they were completely separated from the bones, but entirely in fact, intact. So his face came off, essentially. Mm. The right upper arm was torn to pieces, but still attached to the body. Both hands had been separated from the lower arms. The right thigh, leg, and foot were missing, but the knee joint was found. The left thigh had been separated from the pelvis below the hip joint. The pelvis itself had been divided into three parts. And to one of these parts, a small segment of the small bowel was attached. The penis was present but invaginated. And I did look that up. It means it was basically turned inside out. Good God. Yeah. That hurts the worst, I think, for our men. Oh, I'm hurt very much. So. <laughs> the soft tissues of the abdomen and the back had been cut straight through at a level about midway between the umbilicus, umbilicus and the pelvis. And thus had been separated from the pelvis. These soft tissues formed an empty sac. From above, one could look straight down through the larynx into the bottom of his body. All of the thoracic and abdominal organs had been expelled except for the trachea and a fragment of the small bowel, and even the spine and most of the ribs had been expelled individually. Whew. Very strangely, the liver was found somewhere on the deck above and was complete as if surgically dissected out of the body. What the the hell? Was liver just chilling. Good God. Yeah, that's horrible. And I looked for that for way too long. I also want to point out, this is the second episode in a row where our victim was delivered in four plastic bags. I'm not really liking that pattern. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Let's not repeat that for the next episode, um, Karma. I don't like that. But yeah, wow. that is the very awful and true sad story of Trolls Helovic, who died with his coworkers at 4.08 a.m. on Saturday, November 5th of 1983, and how they all died from what was claimed to be a stupid human error. Or trolls. Yeah, really sucks. Good lord. Um, I know. So after the tragedy, of course, everybody's talking about the Biford dolphin. And they're like, we should probably take a look into how this happened, right? And like, it's not 1974 anymore. It's 1983. And in nine years, technology's come a long way for the oil industry. It's changed a lot. So uh, eyebrows are being raised. Like, how are there not safeguards in, in place for this kind of thing? How – it seems kind of crazy it didn't happen sooner. Like, you're just relying on – someone inside to be like, yeah, it's good. Like it's, it just seems, right. I don't know. Like yeah. it's surprising that it didn't happen sooner. Uh, they also rely on bullhorns that are attached to the walls for their directions. So that they're playing telephone to know when to disconnect clamps and stuff. And then you have all the noise of the ocean, all the noise of the rig, you know? So it's, it's exactly what happened. Only a month after all of this goes on, there's an investigation 
Norway comes out with a new set of mandatory regulations that all the oil rigs that are operating in their water sectors need fail safes in place to prevent this kind of thing. The sad thing, most if not all of the other rigs already had all of those, uh, which is really sad because when the when the Biford came out, it exceeded regulations for its time. So just kind of ridiculous they couldn't keep up with that, you know, through the years. So the Norwegian Petroleum De Directorate, that's a mouthful. They open in the investigation into the incident and they wrap up that they state what well, the absolute cause of the accident was that the door leading from the trunk to the bell was unlatched while the system was still under pressure and that none of the internal door had successfully been latched apart from the bell. They conclude this was caused by human error and failure to complete the routine protocol. But nobody really knows because, you know, the human who did that, he died. So, like, nobody really knows if he heard something or if he was told something and opened it or what, where the miscommunication lies. Nobody really knows. But the family hears of this investigation. They're like, first, why did it take? our family dying for you guys to do something about safety regulations in your rig. Right. But more than that, how are you going to say human error if it really can't be proven? You, know, you yeah. can't prove that someone didn't give a direction incorrectly or something, or uh, the lock failed in some way. Like you can't really prove that. And then they learn more and they find out that there's all kinds of regulations in place for saturation divers, including how many consecutive hours they're allowed to work. Yeah. I was going to say, I think yeah. exhaustion played, a uh, key role here because I think the guy may have just done it because he was freaking tired. He was really, really tired and didn't realize that he didn't get the okay. I, I honestly, I'm I'm thinking maybe he just, okay, bloop, and everyone's dead except for the one guy. And I'm so glad that you picked up on that because that is exactly what went through my head, like hearing all of this. Like there are regulations in place for how many hours saturation divers can work. And do you want to guess – what the maximum number of hours a day they're allowed to work. And I'll give 20. you a hint. It's not fucking 13. <laughs> 24. They're allowed to work about eight. It's usually eight hours a day. Um, and that's time spent working, not time spent in the chamber. So they spend their days, you know, supposed to be relaxing for two thirds of their day and then working for one third. This place is doing the opposite. Okay. So we're double worked already. The families find this information and they're like, oh, I wonder if that's why this guy pulled the plug on the rig. Maybe he yeah. was fucking tired. Yeah. Further investigation uncovers records of shift logs and finds that in the 90 days, actually less than 90 days, between August 15th and November 5th of the, the day of the accident, 38% of all the shifts worked during that time in the Biford Dolphin exceeded that eight-hour maximum. So. Wow. So just under half. Lucky it didn't happen before because it should Extremely have. Extremely lucky that it yeah. – I mean, not for trolls, obviously, but just who knows. There could have been more people working at that time or something. So all the families, you know, start to go after this company because at the very least, they're like, these people didn't protect our family members and they, they lived off of them like that. They were out doing this work to support their families. So now they don't have that source of income. They have nothing except for, you know, they're at home taking care of their families and they don't have anyone to provide for them now. So they're like, yo, you need to compensate us in some way. So you right. think this little sweet oil company that overworks his employees compensates the families of the people that died? Hell no. Hell no, they don't. Of course not. Because, you know, that would cut into their profit. Exactly. It's all about profit. So they denied the family any compensation and they go on with their life replacing the divers and biz as usual. You know? Wow. Fucked up. It's fucking sad, um, man. It is. Yeah. Unfortunately for dolphin drilling, though, these families aren't no bitches. I'll tell you right now, they're not going to lay down and take it. So yeah. they see right through this bullshit and they're like, oh, no, no, you overworked our men. You didn't protect them. You didn't, you know, you didn't keep up. You need to pay up. So they band, yeah. to get, blah, 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 band together, you can see I'm getting tired, and form the North Sea Divers Alliance. And they diligently work for years to uncover more and more information until finally in 2006, bam. The company, 25 years after their family's death, are finally compensated. God. So the Norwegian government, crazy. yeah, I know, 25 years. Like most of those people, God knows if some of them made it okay, if they're homeless now, you know. Yeah. But they finally, 25 years later, the Norwegian government releases a report that uncovers that faulty equipment was to blame for the tragedy and not human error. And then they suggest that the Norwegian oil regulators had made several recommendations to the Biford Dolphin over the years regarding their diving systems and the fact that they weren't fitted with interlocks, which would have prevented someone from opening the chamber while it was pressurized. 
yeah. didn't have pressure gauges on the outside of the trunk for the tenders to visualize or any other safety feature that literally would have prevented these deaths of these four divers and tender. The mechanical disadvantage was not listed in this original report, and had it been, it's likely the families would have been compensated immediately and would not have had to struggle for 25 years fighting this oil conglomerate. Right. So to this day, family members say they haven't received so much as an apology for the disaster that was basically caused by their negligence and their failure to update decade-old protocols. You know what's funny is they know, they probably knew that if this happens before that happens, it's going to be explosive, right? True. So, you know what I'm saying? Why rely on, hey, we're good to go. Go ahead and open it or whatever. That's terrible. That They didn't care about their divers at all. No. And in the 70s, maybe that's how things had to be because they, you know, that was such like a new concept. I'm sure pressurization wasn't like a huge deal in the 70s. It was probably relatively new. And so a lot of it was probably exploration. But like in the 80s, you guys have been doing this for 10 years now. You got to keep, I have hiccups now. You got to keep up with the times and like, you know, take care of your people. It's like all the, so many of our stories have been companies that employees die and they don't do anything for the families. Like our poor Kieran Marshall and how he fought after Erica Marshall was killed by a decompression chamber with her horse facility. And like, they didn't do anything for her either. They were actually trying to fight over who would pay her, her death lawsuit, wrongful death lawsuit. So I remember that. That was crazy too. Pretty messed up. Like, if you're an organization and you have employees, treat your fucking people right and treat their family right because it's, it's really messed up. It's not fair. So I have a too cool for school fact, and I am I like this one because I'm excited. Um, I saved the question that I know everyone's asking right now. Well, I, I'd like to imagine that you're all asking. No? I'm asking. Okay. <laughs> I know all you want to know what happened to the Biford Dolphin, you know? That whole thing, did what happened to it? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm being sarcastic. Um, we lived on to drill another day for whatever reason. Well, probably because the original report didn't come out for 25 years, so it kept drilling. Um, they hired some new divers. They did up their safety protocols and dealt with their little hiccup because, remember, it wasn't officially their fault yet. But then on April 17th of 2002, a 44-year-old employee was struck in the head and killed in an industrial accident while on the Biford. And the incident garnered pretty widespread attention, rightfully so. It actually cost the company this huge exploration contract that they had with this company called Stat Oil. And this was a big time deal. And losing that contract ultimately ended up costing the Biford Dolphin, um, not the Biford, but the Dolphin Drilling, millions of dollars in lost profits. Mm. So 2016, leading a trailing decline of annual profits, the Biford was put out of service and sent to oil drilling heaven, never to drill an ocean floor again. Oh, big loss, I know. So sad. I know. Oh, our poor oceans aren't going to be desecrated. Oh, it's okay. They'll have my other ones in to take the place. How yeah, gross was that autopsy report from a scale of one to ten? Twenty-five. That was pretty. Yeah. Crazy. I know. I worked so hard to find it. I was like, I can't not read it. The detail is amazing, man. Good job. Good lord. Yeah. Jesus Christ! I, I still see it in my head, and I know I haven't seen the actual photo. <laughs> yeah, I'm not I'm not going to do that by sending that one to you, but I have the report. It's like, I forget, eight or 12 pages or something. And all of the images from all of the divers and the tender who died are in there. And Ooh. really, um, like, they have a, a photo of Trolls' face. And, like, it literally looks like you just snatched his face off. Like, if you held it up, it looks the same. His nose sticks out. Everything's on there. But there's nothing behind it. <laughs> it's just really creepy. Wow. Really, really scary. His little mustache is still on there. Like, super weird. So, like, face off from... That movie yeah. with uh, John Travolta and Nicolas Cage. Oh, do they take their faces off in that movie? Yeah, they swap them. Oh, God! Just like rip it off and slap it on each other. Like do they use yeah, glue? Yeah, like, they removed and they put it on each other. And uh, yeah, it was. Oh God, uh, that's terrifying. Okay, I thought it was gonna be like <laughs> a fun, like a Freaky Friday movie where they wake up in each other's skin. But I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> So I know you know this game. I, we can't play it with the divers because they didn't have any indication that anything was wrong until it, you know, until it was. But let's do it from the perspective of the wives at home. So, David, you're a housewife okay. in the 1980s. You're handling life with your kids by yourself. Con, mm-hmm. your husband is out playing mermaids in the North Sea for weeks at a time. Pro, he's making bank and you don't have to work or basically do anything. So your husband okay. comes home one day and he's like, hey, dear, my rig doesn't have any safety provisions in place whatsoever. And my line of work is the most dangerous job there is. 
what are you doing? Are you going to be like, bye, have a good day? Or is he finding another job? Yeah, if it's me and I care for this person, they're finding another job. Yeah. If I don't right. care and I'm like, you know what? The milkman's looking pretty good. Go ahead and go to work. <laughs> that was here. literally my answer. I was like, depends on how much I like the guy, I guess. <laughs> if he's annoying me, I'm like, oh, isn't it, isn't it time to work? What, you, what do you leave any day now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. no. That, they are not working if I care about them for sure. They're finding yeah. another job. Yeah, not in that. That's that's too much. Like, I don't know. There's dangerous and there's like, you're really, every time you go down there, you're risking death in a pretty significant way. You know, not only that, you're spending a huge amount of time away from your family because you have to decompress for a week. There are complications. Now you have to go to the hospital. Oh, wait, you got to go. Oh, you're, you're okay now. So now you got to go dive again, right? And do some more work. And now you're in a week of the decompression champ for that's that's too much away from your family and they didn't have that and then like think of what you're doing to your body by keeping yourself i mean with all the nitrogen and stuff compressing doing that for a week and then going and living your daily life think how much that ages you yeah so is that what happens it ages them is it i mean i would imagine because it's compressing all of your body yeah there's got to be something going on that i mean are there a lot of old uh divers that uh you know what I mean? So, I tried to look up some stats on divers. I couldn't find anything since 2015, but as of 2015, there were only 3,300 commercial saturation divers, um, like in the world. Okay. So it's a very specialized field, uh, probably because you know either you're good at it and you die because you're spending so much time underwater, or you're bad at it and you die because you're spending so much time underwater. So I feel like that's probably why there's so few of them because it's who wants to do that? Like. And then you're not even getting to play with your money. You have to send it to the wife at home and then go back down. Mm-hmm. Never seeing sunlight for weeks at a time. Oh, no thanks. Yeah. No, those guys ended up single for sure after a while. Yeah. So let's do our we- sources and question of the week and the hint so that we can end with the joke. Because I know this one's really dark and like kind of trendy. With I really liked this one because the Titan just happened. And I think submersibles are just on people's minds. So I wanted to touch on this because I know it's not quite the same. Um, but it is, you know, an exchange of pressure kills people kind of the same way. So our bodies aren't meant to to change atmospheres. I'm sorry. The Titan, wasn't that an implosion? Yeah, that was, um, because it was pressurized and went underwater and there was, um, like an opportunity for loss of pressure. Something happened and it imploded all the, all, everything that was inside got like, you know, pressurized to nothing. They were much, much deeper than um, the Biford Dolphin because they were still under nine atmospheres of pressure. But that e- that only equates to like 300 feet. The Titan was at 12,000 feet, I think, when it imploded at the seafloor by the Titanic. So that was obviously much more, um, I don't know, I feel like the Biford would have completely exploded like that if it were 12,000 feet into the ocean as well. But it was right. only a few hundred feet. Wicked. Still pretty traumatic, though. Yeah. I'm just glad he didn't feel anything. I'm really glad for that. I know. That would have been, imagine, I mean, I'm glad that he didn't because you wouldn't have known it until you, you know, by the time you were being sucked through that thing. Just the pressure it takes to push a human like that through a four inch gap. Ugh. Yikes. Can you imagine though, if it's like the opposite, if it's not super pressurized, like there's, but it was slow. Can you imagine if it was slow? Oh, God. That'd be excruciating suffering. He's feeling it now. He's still alive. And it's just slowly going through that four inch. No, forget about that. No, 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 no. No, no, no. no, no. Um, I do want to breeze through my sources again real quick because you know me. I like to source my info. And I got some freaking good ones. Yeah. I can get myself. Oh, my gosh. Orchestrated here. I can never. Just trying to get me some. Content. Okay, there we go. Good deal. The information contained in this episode was fucking hard as shit to find. And what I did was I found a bunch of reports that were in Norwegian. And did you know Google Translate has a character max? They do. Guess what? It's not eight pages. So I spent a long time copying and pasting paragraphs from Norwegian into English just so I could verify the little information that I was able to find. Um, But then I finally landed on that mother load. What? Hard worker. I know. I was. I messaged you like three in the morning or something. I was still up trying to find stuff last night. Uh, 
the biggest piece of information or biggest source of information that I could find was that article from the American Journal of Forensic Medicine and Pathology, and that's titled An Explosive Decompression Accident, and it was written by a bunch of doctors, Casey Gertson, MD, E. Sandstad, MD, I. Mortald, MD, G. Bang, MD, cool name, by the way, I really hope your first name is Gang, A. J. Bearson, MD, S. Eidsvik, MD, lots of letters in this article. So you guys are really smart and you came together and it took seven of you to like write that super graphic, um, <laughs> super graphic autopsy report. So I dig it. G Bang, the most information in it. So G Bang had the most information, I'm sure. I'm sure they were on top of it for everyone. He really likes to collaborate. From what I understand. <laughs> That's a better one than mine. Damn it. <laughs> yeah, G-Bang, if you're still alive, I hope you utilize your name to its full potential. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> um, I did borrow some facts um, from a few other articles. So I got some stuff on Wikipedia. They have a whole article. Most of it's pretty accurate. Business Insider had some stuff. Tumblr, surprisingly. I don't usually go to Tumblr, but they had some stuff. How Stuff Works, WikiTree, Sudoku, Rank Top 10 had some information that I really couldn't find anywhere else, so good job for them. And then um, adventuresnahistoria.uol.com.br, which the whole thing's in Norwegian, so have fun translating it, but that's where the majority of the info is. <laughs> Lastly, I need to thank the good fix of Reddit, because... Y'all Redditors always come out when I need you. Like I, when I can't find something, I'll go to Reddit nine times out of 10, I can find it. So thank you guys. I appreciate you. Keep it coming. Um, there, these are the only resources I pulled information from, but I read dozens and dozens of articles. They just all kind of repeated the same info. There's not a lot about trolls outside of this incident. Um, even so there is like a little family tree page out there somewhere that Lars Hellevik runs. I tried to reach out because it said like it had a contact method for him but it was like a phone number that was missing two digits. So I'm really not sure if it's like a threads link or so. I have no fucking clue. I didn't reach out to him, but he does operate his brother's page very minimally. There's very little information. Yeah, that's it. Um, pretty bare bones stuff on his childhood. So there you go. So my question of the week, you ready? Question of the week for episode 12 is a good one. I thought hard on this and I'm really excited to hear some of the answers. <laughs> Your question is, your life depends on the competence of your coworkers. Are you living mm. or dying? <laughs> so I'm really excited. Have some fun with it. If you're going to die, tell me how, what line of work do you do? How are you dying? How are you living? Whatever. Um, or is it like who you work with? You know, maybe if, on Tuesday, I'm for sure dead. But on Thursday, I'm living because my girl Becky, you know, works with me. Just make it fun. For those of you who don't like work for whatever reason, you can use family or pets or whatever. I'm sure there's some biological organism near you somewhere. Um, but yeah, you know what to do? Go to Instagram, go to TikTok at one, nothing podcast, submit your answers in the comments. Um, I'm going to give you like a week or so this time. And we're going to talk about them in episode 13. The hint for episode 13, by the way, Sherwin Williams with a nasty attitude. Ooh. Yeah. So I'm really excited for you guys to be like, Oh, it's a story about a painter who murdered somebody. <laughs> we'll see. All right, Wait. and now we're at my most favorite time. Are we ready for my most favorite time? Let's hear it. I have high expectations for your reaction. It's the joke of the day. <clears throat> and you know, as one does, as I do, I have to make it relevant to the episode. So I found an oil joke. Are you ready? That's good. <laughs> an aspiring oil tycoon's rig has just caught fire, and it's burning faster and faster, destroying the enormous rig as it burns. A company sees the smoke billowing and arrives on the scene with all of its equipment and offers to extinguish the fire and repair the rig at the low cost of $100 million. Wow. The oil tycoon laughs and replies, at $100 million, I'll let the whole damn thing burn itself out and just retire on what I've already made. I'm not paying you $100 million to repair my rig. So they leave. The next day, another company comes, sees the smoke, and shows up at his door. And they're like, let us at least put out the fire for you. We don't got to repair it. Let us just put it out. And he's like, well, what would you charge me? And they're like, we'll do it for a million. So again, the tycoon chuckles. And he's like, that might as well be $100 million to me right now. So I guess I'll just prepare to lose my livelihood. So they go ahead and leave. The day after that, a scrawny hillbilly with a thick country accent pulls up with a truck bed filled with 10-plus men. And just a couple more clinging to the back of the tailgate. 
Howdy, partner, the driver says, draping his arm out of the window. Bet you I can put that there fire out for you. The oil rig looks at the hillbilly up and down and chuffs. What's your price? He asks. My guys and I will do it for a thousand bucks. <laughs> I hope you like my hillbilly accent. I'm trying really hard. I love it. I love it. <laughs> the oil tycoon is ecstatic and excited to see if this works. So he's like, all right, there's a 10K. Go on, put the fire out. So the hillbilly puts the truck in gear and heads towards the flaming rig with his crew. He drives straight through into the inferno and every man in the back of the truck is burned as it rolls through. When it finally reaches the other side, the fire was completely snuffed out and the oil tycoon is in disbelief. He runs over to the hillbilly's side in the truck, who's the sole survivor, and says, overjoyed, this is the damnedest thing I ever seen. Boy, you sacrificed your entire crew to put out my fire. I didn't have an ounce of faith in you boys, but you got I got to give it to you. You did it. But I do have to ask, though, what are you going to do with that $10,000? And the hillbilly said, first thing I'm going to do, Mr. Sir, is get these here brakes fixed on this truck. <laughs> I just thought that was so stupid and cute. I laughed oh. out loud in reality when I read that. I was like, oh, yeah, that's the one for sure. You ever had that one? Like, no, this is the one. Yeah, that was the one. So I thought that was funny. Fix the brakes on the truck. We rolled through the fire and everybody died. So, well, you know, typical one nothing joke. I love it. Yeah, I know. So, Can I ask a question for yeah. next week now? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. If a uh, coworker, right? If we have yeah. to count our coworker. Yeah, Rachel. If Rachel. <laughs> we might survive, Rachel, but guess what? We're not going to make it. <laughs> Rachel's going to kill us all. <laughs> <laughs> The funniest thing is me and Rachel did work together and there were days where I could definitely be like, no, this girl's saving my life a hundred percent. Like she's got my back. And there's other days where she would be sleeping in the corner and I'd be like, no, I'd die a hundred percent. She would sleep through my death. It'd be traumatic. She'd wake up. All of our guts would be all around the place. She'd be like, oh, what happened? I overslept. <laughs> That's a hoot. Just all right. Well, one... What's Just that? Kidding. I said, just kidding, Rach. We're just kidding. We love Rachel. Everybody yeah. loves Rachel. It's so funny how many comments and like posts I get being like, tell Rachel this or has, <laughs> is she dating that guy? She has a couple, like, I think they're high schooler kids the way they talk. If they're listening, I'm giving you all a shout out. I forget your name. Um, but they emailed me being, they, they have a bet going. If the guy that Rachel brings up from time to time is a situationship or a relationship, <laughs> like they have a, a going bet. Like it's just I remember you saying that. That it's funny. Hysterical. I was like, girl, you have more entertainment than Netflix right now. <laughs> As always, David, I had such a good time with you on this one. It was a little bit yeah. different than the last one we did, which was good because I stayed away from kids for this. Um, yes. Can I have you drop your socials again and tell us where to find you and where to get your stuff? Yes, I am on Instagram and Facebook down the rabbit hole. Uh, and my uh, Etsy shop is called Deeper Down. You can go to deeperdown.store, that's one, or you can just go to Etsy and look for Deeper Down. I love it. Great stuff. And when I get my shirt, I am posting it for all you guys to see, and I expect yeah. orders because let me tell you, I'm pumped. Yeah. Repping right. the loco, repping the rabbit. Ooh, there's a good one. Rep the rabbit. There's a Rep tag the for you. I like it. <laughs> oh gosh well thank you guys so much for sticking with us i know that these episodes have been long lately but there's just some so much good stuff to get through and i've really been one-upping my own research so yeah cool have a good night david we shall see you next time thank you again for joining us and for everybody listening my pleasure my pleasure i'm <laughs> just kidding stay alive stay alive <laughs> Ah... Uh...